She said uh, they were out cheering for a soccer team that won. They were out cheering, cheering, having fun cheering. And she said, I wasn't even cheering. I was just standing watching them. But my son was cheering. Her son was a college student. She said, but my son was a cheer. And a bomb went on him. And she had to collect his pieces. That type of thing that's happening in Iraq now. September 11th happened. I was in sixth grade at the time. Everyone was talking about terrorists and stuff like that, and then it like hit me. I was like, my, my people are from there, you know? I'm Chaldean. Because like people were telling me, like, why don't you go back to your country and stuff? I was like, that has like nothing to do with me, you know? Like, I grew up like skateboarding and playing video games, and you know, like I didn't even know I was like associated, even though that's where my whole background comes from. I wasn't ashamed, I just didn't really want to have it out there, you know? Because, like, if you say Chaldean, goes back to Middle Eastern, Arabic, terrorism, all those stereotypes. Uh, in high school, I, I mainly ha uh, hung out with the white, white crowd. I was, like, the only Chaldean person with long hair. Most Chaldeans, they'd, like, look at me and give me that look like, is this guy serious? Like, he has long hair and, you know, skateboard. I was whitewashed. Sometimes they, of course, made the racist jokes toward Chaldeans. I would just laugh with them. Um, the Chaldean people didn't like it that I skateboarded, and the white people didn't like it that I acted white. There's a lot of overprotectiveness. If you wanted to take a Chaldean girl out on a date, it would have to be with other guys and other girls, never a one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing. Or if it did, it would have to be in complete secrecy. <laughs> You're never really allowed to date, you know, until you get married. I had a couple of Chaldean friends who dated Chaldean girls, and they told me, like, it was a nightmare because they could never hang out except seeing each other at school. They couldn't hold hands in school, like in the hallways and stuff, because other people would see and talk or do, any, do anything in public with him just because of her reputation, because that's a very big thing, especially with Chaldean girls, their reputation, and especially guys too. Reputation is a big thing to uphold. If I'm in trouble or something, I'll try and get myself out of it by going to my room and like closing the door, but that doesn't work because 30 seconds after my dad will be following me, he'd be like, what are you doing up there? You know, come back, we're not done talking. And I'll be like, Dad, just leave me alone. And then like my mom would have heard me and she's like, wait a sec, just leave me alone. There's no such thing as leave me alone, you know, where everything you do is with the family. There's no such thing as like alone, you know. If I sneeze, my grandparents will know about it. If you really think about it, there's vast differences between Chaldeans and Americans, you know. It's my people, I can't, I can't, you know, deny who I am forever. Like I have to accept it. I'm 17. My dad came over to the States when he was about 11 years old with his dad. I, I want to say initially kind of during World War II. He's from um, Iraq, uh, specifically from a small village called Tilkepe. They ended up going to Detroit, Michigan, which, um, which at the time basically was sort of this kind of growing industry, obviously with the car industry. And so there was a lot of opportunity there. And, and, and it wasn't that the, that the Chaldeans were going there to work in the car industry. It was sort of, they, they're, they're known as kind of convenience stores and restaurants and, and type, of, type of people. So they knew that that was sort of like a growing area. But then after Detroit, San Diego and Arizona, and I believe Chicago uh, were like sort of the three or four areas that a lot of Chaldeans migrated to, Detroit being the main one. And I'd say San Diego being the second. Accept this 
sacrifice from our hands. In His grace and mercy, Amen. The Christians, they are oppressed in Iraq. Door by door, they hang notice, leave. If you stay, we'll kill you. I was born and raised in Basra. My father, he wanted to be a merchant. He opened his uh, first uh, store. It was uh, like a mama, papa type of store. You want to hurry up and start working on the salad piece? You want to come on? And then expand, expand, expand. And in 1969, he did own a lot of stores in Basra. That's when, um, when the Bapai uh, ruled. They, um, they took over the business. So as soon as we finish the salad, we leave, okay? It wasn't only my father. There was about three, four other very famous uh, merchants in Basra. One of them was hanged. Uh, others were in prison for no reasons. My father's lawyer advised my mother, take the kids and leave. Four girls, two boys. We were all young. It's already like at one o'clock in the morning in Iraq. So we need to go and talk to your dad right now. They arranged a taxi and uh, they put us all in that taxi. Leave Basra, not knowing where to go. We left a big house. We left our servant. We left our cars and we hit to Baghdad. Imagine traveling nine hours in that little taxi. When you leave, not knowing your fate, you don't know what, what will happen to you. It, it's just, it's a fear, it's, it's a, so much fear. You don't know if they would uh, stop you in the middle of the road and they arrest the whole entire family. We were shaking when we got to back then. I was uh, 13 years old. When we got to Baghdad, we did not leave the house for months, fearing that something would happen to us. When they started the Iran-Iraq war, I was 21. They start taking children. And my brother, he was only 11 years old. And they gave him a gun. That put a rage for my father. He said, 11 years old? I have a gun? And that's when he said, I cannot live here anymore. We have to find a way to leave. <laughs> oh my God, no one. One family knows how to do it, nobody else. Leaving Iraq during that time, it was very difficult because we have to have a release from the government to leave the country. We went to the airport to leave Baghdad and they were, are you leaving? Did they give you a release? <laughs> My mom and dad, the night before, they told us, if anything happened, this is the decision we made, all of us together. Do we all want to leave? So we say yes. Imagine that waiting time, we were waiting for the airplane. Imagine what happened to us. That half an hour. It was scary. You would never forget that experience. Never. I mean, if they know that we're leaving, they'll arrest us. My father would be hanged. I would be in a prison. My mom, she would be killed. My dad had, you know, reached a certain age. He hadn't gotten married. My grandpa decided to take him back to the old country and he went to different families and, and met four or five different girls. They would literally like have tea and coffee and dessert and talk with the family, you know, between the two heads of the families. And then my dad was like, yeah, I like her. And she's like, yeah, I like him. And, and they got married. I'm almost in shock that that's how, you know, 
that that's how they ended up meeting. It's, it's fascinating because even somebody with not a lot in America could go back to the Middle East or go back to Iraq and really like have his pick of the litter in terms of getting a wife. And, and honestly, like I even know a few people that have done it in recent years, which to me boggles my mind. It just doesn't seem like to me personally like the right way to do it or the way that I would do it or want my kids to do it. Sabah, uh, min Iraq. I am Sabah and I am a refugee from Iraq. I just arrived three months ago. I am Hasiba. We lived a horrible life in Mosul. Christians were, were tortured in Mosul, killing, slaughters, and everything. We couldn't go to church anymore. Just to, to walk in the street it was very difficult. Living in Iraq was not well. There is a lot of bombing. Two of my children, a girl and a boy, they used to go to school. From the time they leave home until the time they come back, I have a hard time waiting for them to come home. My two children, they were killed in Iraq. My son was just a student. He was very smart in school. It's uh, very difficult to talk about my son's death. It's hard. I can't explain it. Me and my uh, family escaped uh, to Turkey. And then we came to California. My children, they go to school and they have a better education. Thank God there is no bombing uh, and I'm living a better life. Thank God here we have the peace. We're, we're happy here. My name is Majdolene Yunan and I am 29 years old. I got married in 2000. The accident happened in 2003. Uh, the American plane bombed our house. My house was destroyed. I lost my vision. And of course, I lost the look or my face, the way it used to look. And my husband lost his eye. I lost my daughter. She was uh, two years old. And I was also pregnant eight months with my son, David. I lost my son. My sadness has no description. I am dying every single day. I hope somebody will understand what's happening to my heart. Sometimes I feel my daughter, she is behind the door knocking so I can open the door for her. When my mom passed away, um, in my family, there's four boys and one girl, my sister, who is the youngest. And I remember when, when we went to the funeral, they, they wanted all the, the men to sit on one side and they wanted the women to sit on the other. And I was like sort of in shock. I'm like, what? And I remember my sister wanting to come sit with us and some of the older women coming to pull her away from us. And I'm like, what are you, what are you guys doing? And they're like, well, she, this is not right. She's not supposed to sit on this side. People were like, oh my God, I can't believe they're, they're not abiding by tradition. And for me, you know, you know I, I think there's, a lot, of, I think there's a, a lot of times you need to respect tradition and, and need to abide by tradition. But I think there's certain moments and times where you need to do what's right for you. And for me, my sister needed her, her brothers around her. And I felt that superseded any type of tradition. I had heard of, about America when I was about six, seven years old, and I used to dream I, uh, that maybe someday I'll go there. Where is that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I was not as lucky as my grandchildren. I lost my father at age 12. Uh, it, it was not easy for me, but my mom was a totally illiterate woman, said to me, 
son, I'm going to take you to Baghdad so you can go to this Jesuit school. And I was left with relatives that I did not know. And I cried my eyes out at age 12. Miss my mother, my brothers, sisters. But I was determined to study. I am in the library and I saw something called the Declaration of Independence. I, I didn't even have a clue. I was moved and touched very, very much when I read that uh, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator. And the Jesuit priest explained to me what Thomas Jefferson had written, one of the most moving uh, phrases in the Declaration of Independence. America is a country in which everything is possible. I finished high school, and my mom insisted that I go to college. But mom, we cannot afford it. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And she brought me the money. And then one day, I was looking at her fingers. You see the whites here. And that was the last thing she had from my father, the ring. She sold it so I could go to college. That was my mother. They said, August 1, 1947, your visa will be ready. Once I got the paper, it was like the Constitution of the United States to me. I, I couldn't believe I had the papers. Monday, September 1 boarded a bus and uh, I could see the whole family crying and I said, God, please don't make me cry. We came to Damascus, following there to Beirut, we went to Haifa, Haifa to Alexandria and from Alexandria I boarded a ship. The only time I felt that I am on my way to America, really, is when that ship moved slowly from the harbor. And then we were in the Mediterranean, and you cannot see land anymore. I knew we were on our way. I, I never lost faith that I would make it in America. Before we got to New York Harbor, we were notified that we would see the Statue of Liberty. We would see the light. And we became so anxious and so eager. And we were all hanging onto the railings, trying to see New York. And once you saw those lights, the traffic, the Statue of Liberty facing Europe, which later on I would know, give me, you're tired and you're poor and you're uh, huddled masses. You know, I, it's a, it's a moving story. America is, America is the land where anybody, anybody, as I tell my grandchildren, anybody can achieve whatever they want if they put their mind to it and work hard. This land is blessed. This land, believe it or not, I believe it. I believe it. And it is, uh, I get emotional when I talk about it.
Let's go. Yo, yo, and I'm open for business. Just another day to put food on the table. Ever since I was a kid, hip hop was like my main music that I was into. The older generation doesn't really understand it very well, and I would say the Chaldean church doesn't understand it. Got nothing in my government name, my brother's the brains. Me, I'm like in love with this game. I have plenty of Chaldean supporters my age and even older my dad's friends come come to me and ask me for <laughs> the lyrics to my songs in Arabic my dad first came in 1973 he worked hard enough to get himself a liquor store of his own I remember my father uh, for my whole life really working uh, opening at the store every day some days having to close. Once I graduated high school, I worked seven days a week at the store and took a full uh, load of, of class. I graduated from the University of San Diego in three and a half years. I don't consider this working at our family business as being work. It's kind of like what I have to do, you know, for the family. I like to incorporate that in my music and the fact that I do work hard. Also, I do have this other side of me that's a political side socially aware. We went out to the desert in the 120 degree heat, shot the video, and, and my personal opinion at the time was, oh, you know, we're just gonna make a video, it's, it's not gonna get anywhere, nobody wants to hear this, you know, this kind of music. Dear Mr. George Bush, why do you insist to make a fool of us for over 200 years? We stood for what's good, now we despise by peers. This ain't gonna last for long. The wish is dead, George. Yo, the wish is gone. After its release on YouTube, Fox News calls and says, okay, we want you on Hannity and Combs. I start calling my friends, I'm gonna be on Hannity and Combs, and everybody has like the same devastated, like, Happy, but devastated, man. Oh, no. Bring it on. Bring it. It sounds pretty. You can sing along because the sound of gunfire is my favorite song. Welcome back to Hannity and Combs. I'm Chuck Norris filling in for Sean Hannity. That was a clip of rapper Tim's music video, Iraq. Glad to have you on, Tim's. And after that, everything caught on and snowballed more so than I ever would have imagined. Our next guest is a young man who was born to Iraqi Christian parents who left their homeland in the 1970s. Well, he's known as Tim's, and his debut CD, Open for Business, chronicles his life as an Iraqi American. And whether or not you like his music, it certainly strikes a chord. I know what I'm doing is pro-America. A lot of people think that because my song is anti-war, I'm being anti-American, but that's not the case. I get emails all the time from, from troops telling me how much they love the song, how much they appreciate that I'm coming out and saying these things that nobody else is saying. It was the story that everybody was looking at. It's almost, you know, just with my culture and being Iraqi American Chaldean from a Muslim country. It's like a train wreck of a story, and so people stop and look, and, and that's what happened. People stopped and looked. It ain't over. Open for business, morning to night. Gotta get it right, gotta, gotta get it right. Said I'm open for business, 365. Gotta stay alive. Our parents, they made the sacrifice, and they did what they had to do to get us here, and I think it's up to us to take it to the next level. My older brother worked in the store. He has actually become a doctor, so, so I had to pick up his shift in the meantime. <laughs> Just like the dream of, of my parents, you know, come to America, raise your kids, and then become doctors and lawyers. My name is Ivan Jamil. Seven years ago, I was a happy married woman with a child in Iran. 